Uh, well, w welcome to everyone. I'm Dan kurtz uh, Great to see uh, a big crowd here. We've got a lot to cover, um, probably 40% of the world's population, so we'll get right into it. Um, these kinds of panels um, on India and China tend to yield up um, fairly predictable cliches. You have the you know, efficient authoritarian China next to the dysfunctional democracy. Um, we're lucky to have panelists here whose work has really gone beyond those cliches and gone deeper than those cliches. So I hope that uh, over, the, over the course of the discussion, we get way beyond um, the, those usual kind of talking points. Um, and at the end, we will go to all of you to uh, press them even further. So um, I think the two, uh, two men directly to my left probably need very little introduction to this crowd. Um, Nandan Nilakani, uh, fur furthest, um, wrote in his book a couple years ago, business people do not make good public intellectuals. Um, and I don't know if these two disprove that rule because they're so exceptional, but um, two uh, outstanding businessmen who are now among India's foremost public intellectuals and uh, both have written many um, best-selling fantastic books that offer a really kind of idiosyncratic take on where India is going and, and what the Indian story will be. And Peter Hessler, who's one of the great American foreign correspondents, uh, staff writer for The New Yorker, based in China for many years, um, now in Cairo, he's mastered China after a decade or so. Um, he will be talking about China today, but has written on a much broader range of topics and has a book coming out called Strange Stones. Uh, later this spring that will um, address some of uh, a broader range and broader geography. So with that, um, we will go into the questions. I want to start with, with, with Nandan. Um, in your book, Imagining India, a couple of years ago, you talked about this politics of hope that you saw among the rising Indian middle class. And you contrasted that with the cynicism of the political establishment, um, and yet identified that as a real cause for hope for India. Um, a few years later, the economy is not growing quite as fast. Uh, there are protests in the street, it seems, every week. Do you still see a politics of hope, or is there a new kind of anger? And, and do you still have the optimism you would have had a few years ago? No, I, no, I think I uh, continue to be optimistic. I think, in some sense, the thing you see on the streets is people's aspirations and the sense of all those aspirations not being met. So it's really linked to the same uh, uh, phenomenon that I talked about. And I continue to believe that you know India's strategic advantages uh, remain as they are. The fact that we will be the youngest country in an aging world, uh, a very deep uh, bench of entrepreneurs, our investment and you know we are essentially expend out, expensed out the cost of democracy. The fact that I think Indians in general are far more comfortable with globalization, uh, English as a language that uh, you know we have, and so forth, and technology. I think all these things continue to be strategic advantages. Now, definitely, there's a lot to be done on the ground, and uh, there's a lot of execution challenges. But I'd rather have strategic advantages and execution challenges than strategic. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, strategic benefits and. Uh, execution challenges than to have execution excellence and strategic challenges. So I don't know whether that, that makes sense. But uh, so I, I think it, it is something that uh, uh, India can very well uh, pull off. And uh, in some sense, I think people are demanding a society which is more inclusive. People are demanding a society which is fair. People are demanding a society where everybody has uh, access to their basic entitlements and can meet their aspirations. And I think that's the kind of uh, churn that is a very good churn. I think the United States went through this in the last 100 years. You know, 100 years back, you know, if you went to the US and uh, saw this situation, you would also be skeptical about robber barons and, you know, all, all the various things have happened. But over time, they, they cleaned it up. So I'm, I'm also convinced that India is very well equipped to make those uh, changes happen. Um, P Peter, there's also been a kind of surprising amount of, of uh, mass in incidents, as they say, in China. Um, over the course of leadership transition underway. And you know, some people are looking at China and don't see it as quite, quite as stable as, as they once did. Um, you know, you've spent a lot of time with a broad range of, of people in China, traveled the country. Um, are you hopeful that there's a path for political reform? Do you see stability? Um, how, how do you see this playing out over the next couple of years? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, and I guess my perspective on the demonstrations and the mass incidents, as you say, has probably been changed a little bit because I've, I've lived in Cairo now for more than a year. And so that's been 
a big part of the story there. And it, it's, I think it leads me to look at what's, what's happening in China a little differently. I think when we talk about the demonstrations and the unrest that you see in China, you have to think, I, I guess the first question is who's involved, who are the people who are there, and who are the people that are not there? And one thing that's very striking to me is, just look at the photographs from those demonstrations, you see very few young people. Um, you know, it's, you don't see a lot of people in their 20s, you don't see teenagers. I mean, you go to Tahrir Square and you look at the, the, the sort of the energy that drove the Arab Spring, and it was you know, mostly the youth. Um, and there's a reason why that's important, because these are people often who, who might be able to dedicate more to this sort of thing. In China, you look and you see a lot of people who are maybe in their 30s and 40s. It's very hard to go out day after day and protest when you've got, you know, a family to support, when you've got parents who are elderly. Um, you know, whereas in, you know, in Egypt you have all of these young people, some of it's just demographic. In China, you don't, the one-child policy means you don't have as many, as many young people as you do in society like Egypt. Um, and some of it, I think, is also that the, the young people in China feel in, they're like in a very competitive situation and they can't take time away to be involved in politics. That's not where their energies are, are being focused right now. So I think that's a big difference. The other difference that's really important is what are they asking for? And in China, the demonstrations that happen tend to be very localized and very specific. The demand might be, you know, we have a, a plant that's polluting our river here. Um, something needs to be done about this. It's very specific. And whereas in, you know, in, in Cairo, I see these overarching demands. You know, we need to change the system. We need, you know, and before it was we need to overthrow Mubarak. You don't see protests in China calling for the downfall of the, of the Communist Party. Um, that's very important to, to think about. And I think the final thing is, is there institutional support to these demonstrations, these protests? Um, you know, again, to, to contrast with, with Egypt, I mean, we're very focused on what's happened there since 2011, but there were a lot of organizations that were working for that for years. I mean, look at the Muslim Brotherhood has been around for 80 years, and they were very active in politics and had a, you know, sort of a semi-working relationship with the Mubarak regime, but also were in the opposition. You had the April 6th youth movement that was, you know, these were activist groups that were already focused on trying to change the regime, and they were given some space in Egypt to develop. They were, they were there and ready to go. We, we get very focused on the narrative, you know, there's a, a vegetable seller in Tunisia sets himself on fire and then the protests happen and it leads to, to Cairo, but we, we don't necessarily see the backstory, which is that these things were building for a long time. You, we don't have those kind of institutions in China. You know, the Communist Party has been very effective at not allowing, you know, basically organizations to develop that are focused on, on, their, on their downfall. And, and so I think that's a very different situation. You need to have some of that before this energy from the street is going to lead somewhere. So I think that I don't see a lot of coherence in these demonstrations. I think it's mostly just we connect them. You know, it's a big country. A lot of things happen. There's 90,000 mass incidents or whatever. And in our mind, they become linked, but they're not really linked on the ground. Uh, Gertrude, in your most recent book, um, India Grows at Night, you, you make the observation that uh, India has a strong society and a weak state and that China, by contrast, has a strong state and a weak society. Can you say something about what you, uh, what, what you mean by that, and does that lead you to be more optimistic about India than China, more optimistic about China than India? Um, what, what exactly does that difference mean? Well, the mistake we make is to believe that the Indian state has become weak only in recent years. We believe it's because of coalition politics. We believe we, because it's, we've had a very weak prime minister. Uh, but the fact is that India has historically been a weak state and a strong society. Um, the fact is the Indian was always defined by the society, whether the Chinese person was defined by the state. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, our history was a history of political disunity, of kingdoms competing with each other, whereas China's history was a history of empires. And even the four empires we had in India, the Maurya, the Gupta, the Mughal, and the British, they were all weaker than the weakest Chinese empire. And so the, in China, it was the emperor who gave the law, and then he interpreted the law. In India, the law, dharma, preceded the king. And his job was to uphold dharma. And the interpreter of the law 
was not the king, but the Brahmin. So very early on, in the 6th century, with the, with, the, with the first kingdoms, with Magadha and so on, that came up, you had created a liberal division of powers, which actually weakened the state. And so, in 1947, India could only have become a democracy. Uh, and today, India is appropriately rising from below. It's a bottom-up success, unlike China, which is a top-down success. And the other difference between us is that the Chinese are assimilators and we are accumulators. In other words, the same, both India and China were peopled by migrations from Central Asia. In China, they assimilated them into one Han Chinese identity. In India, we accumulated them into Jats, uh, Rajputs, and 2,200 subcastes, and Jatis, we call them. And so, this really also, so therefore, China is like a soup, and we are like a salad, because we can see our different vegetables in the salad, and you know, they're not homogenized. Yes, you need both for a good diet. So. Uh, a, a soup. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, really, um, what the, um, I mean, so oppression in India never came from the state. It came from society. And the answer to that oppression was the Buddha. You know, a spiritual entrepreneur who came along uh, periodically for that. And the Anna Hazare movement today is really a collision between a strong society and a weak state. So it's a classic thing. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that it has to be like this forever. But that, I think, helps as a background to understand our governance problem, um, our issues of the economic slowdown, and, 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 and uh, you know, the, the people make the mistake, Dan, in thinking that the race between China and India is a race of, about who will get rich first. Well, the fact is that China is already 20 years ahead because of that 2% growth rate ch difference and the fact that they've started reforms 10 years before us. And, the, uh, the, so, and both countries, frankly, will become middle class. Some of the descriptions you've given in your stories, Peter, are about that. And uh, so I think the economic issue is not the one where the race is. The race is who will fix its government first. We have to fix our governance, and China has to fix its politics. So if China fixes its politics first, it will win the race. Yeah. If we fix governance, we will win the race. P Peter, as a, as a China hand, does that strike you as uh, accurately capturing the reality in China today? And um, it, 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 is society as weak as Gertrude makes out, or is there some, something there that well, I think there's outsiders other, don't see? There's certainly other factors. I mean, I, mean, I think another big difference was that China suffered this incredible trauma through the middle of the 20th century, um, which I think India didn't go through anything quite like that. And, and you know, sort of it, it, India is a post-colonial society as well. And, and when your political structures, you know, were, were, came from that transition as well, whereas in China they had this incredible, you know, they had the war with the Japanese and they had the Civil War and then they had Mao Zedong. And it, I think it's, a, when they entered the reform period in 1978, this is a very damaged society. Um, and a lot of their vibrancy, a lot of their cultural vibrancy had been destroyed or at least damaged. And so that's, that's part of what they're trying to recover from. But I think broadly speaking, it, you know, it, it is accurate that, that I mean, there's, there's simply much more diversity um, in India than there is in China. Um, you know, a lot of that is just, you know, their concept of themselves as being the Han race is, is very different from the way people here conceive of themselves. Um, and I think also, you know, China has, is, even if you just look at the geography, is a more natural entity. Um, than India is. You know, India is obviously more parts that have been put together. The, 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 just, to, yeah. just to come back for a minute, I think what we need, you, I mean, what we need is for China to have a stronger society and for India to have a stronger state. In other mm -hmm. words, a, a successful nation has both mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. a strong society does bring accountability yeah. into the state. And for us, really, the challenge in India 
is that we need uh, a, 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 a strong liberal state. We need to reaffirm. It's already there in that constitution as the idea, but we need to reaffirm that idea that you need a state which can act quickly, deter in, with determination, with decisiveness when required, that action is bounded by the rule of law and it's accountable to the people. Now, these three pillars do not necessarily reinforce each other. You know, they sometimes undercut each, e e each other. But that, I think, is the classic challenge we have now. Nanda, you, you've worked on at least kind of two, two, two different sides of this. You've worked on making the state effective and accountable. Uh, you're also one of the, the pioneers of the Indian tech sector. Um, you remain optimistic. Uh, a lot of outside observers have become much more pessimistic. How do you, how do you fix uh, the state um, in, in part through the yeah. kind of work no, you're I th doing? I think in some sense, uh, uh, you know, I think the, you know, when I moved from being an entrepreneur to being in government, uh, I, I did grapple with these questions. How, how, you know, I'd spent 30 years being an entrepreneur, running, you know, running companies, not really being involved with the state. And I came to the conclusion that the, we have to come up with an idiom, or we have to come up with an approach which leverages the entrepreneurial and energies of the people. But at the same time, you need to create platforms on which these energies can play out. Because unless you create those platforms, then you don't really, you have chaos. I mean, you have a lot of energy, but they're all pulling in different directions. So while you can't have uh, the sort of everything by the state, you know, uh, to Gujaran's point that you could perhaps have in China, I think you need to create what I think of as platforms, platforms that create a level playing field, uh, platforms that create uh, a way for people to meet the aspirations, and then let innovation, entrepreneurship, and all that flow from that. So that's why the, a lot of the work I do, which you know, one is, is giving uh, an identity to every Indian resident, giving a bank account to every Indian resident, making it easy for them to use technology to access services easily, is all about platforms. It's not about a particular service. It's about a platform that enables people to get access to their entitlements and aspirations in a far more uh, efficient and effective way. And I believe, and the, and part of what we do is we try to design open systems where you create these platforms and then allow individuals to leverage that for doing better and building new solutions. So my learnings both from the private sector in India and in the government is use the energy and entrepreneurship of the private sector and of people to, to, to make things happen. But in government, create these broad platforms which allow everyone to rise uh, much faster. So in some sense, I'm veering out around to the view that the government building platforms and people leveraging the platform, that's the way to make India are very successful. And are you optimistic that will uh, bring India back to high growth, dynamism, relatively well, quickly? Well, obviously, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, uh, this is just an approach of what I do, and I think there are many, many things to bring it back to high growth. But, but absolutely, I think uh, if, 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 you know, if, I mean, you can think of the legal system as a platform, right? I mean, if, if, if the legal system is able to be more efficient or reduce pendency in cases or deliver justice faster, then the whole economy and the whole society gains from that. Or if it, you, know, you can think of, uh, you know, uh, land, land management as a platform, because you, you know one of the challenges we have is land, land acquisition. How do you make sure land is not appropriated? How do you make sure the farmer gets a fair value for his land? That's really about having a rule-based system. It's about having a system where everybody, the owner of the land, the buyer of the land, the government, the state, everybody has a, a clear definition of what they want. So a lot of what we need to do in India, I think, is untangling this, these things and sort of putting in place uh, sort of open, transparent platforms. And I think if you do the more and more of that, I think the rest, the people's drive will take care of that. You know, he, Nandan is absolutely correct. I mean, uh, why should it take us 12 years to get justice for a simple case when it should take you a couple of years or takes a couple, two, three years anywhere else. Why should it take us 10 years to build a road in, in, in our country? So what he calls platforms, I call really a failure of governance. And that's where 
I think the notion of a, an effective state, we have to really, I mean, we have to do these, certainly the UID and other will, uh, will make for some efficiency, in the, especially in the delivery of our, okay. of our services. But we need a, a, far, uh, a, a far more, a far deeper, uh, uh, a far deeper engagement with institutional reform. And in fact, you know, I mean, um, this un whether it's the Anna Hazare movement or this outrage over Nirbhaya, the violence against women, all these are, are I see them actually as hopeful signs. It's, 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 it's the rise of a middle class. When you have demand for reform, because this is what it is, I think reform will takes place much easier when you have that impassioned reform. And of course, it has to be translated from street protests to actual hard work of politics, of legislation changes, changes in accountabilities. Uh, why should uh, every civil service, I mean, India's IAS, top civil service, it's rated four out of five, 80% are rated four out of five, meaning excellent or outstanding people. Now, in which administration can you have that? And the reason is that everybody gets promoted at the same time. Everybody gets the same rewards. If a person works one hour, you get the same reward as if you work for 12 hours in a day. And, and that's what I mean, the very basic guts and, and frankly if if we don't change this and if china doesn't change its politics both countries are going to get stuck in the middle income trap most both countries believe in china and in india they believe that their destiny is to reach forty thousand dollars income per capita which is the u.s income per capita well, that won't happen. I think both countries will become middle class, meaning you'll get to India will be about six, by 2030, it'll be about $6,000 per capita income. China will be about 10, uh, 12. And, but after that, it will be like Latin America for decades. They'll just get stuck. Peter, does that ring true to you? Are you as, as pessimistic about China 10 years out as Gertrude is? I don't know, I don't, are you pessimistic? Or you? No, I think to reach, frankly, this is a great achievement, mm -hmm. if in two decades these countries turn middle class. Mm -hmm. But they both have to. I mean, the human heart requires liberty, mm -hmm. and China does not give liberty. The human being requires good governance to have some predictability so that when you go out on the street, you, you'll be all right. Mm -hmm. Now, you need both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's sort of, I think China may be getting to a bit of a transition. And I mean, I, I arrived there in the mid-90s and, and, and was a teacher. And I think that was an era when you really see that there was a lot of opportunity for people to improve their situation. And it was, in many ways, a fairly egalitarian society in terms of your chances. It didn't really matter so much what your background was. If you were smart and worked hard, there were avenues for success. And I could see that in my students I taught about 100 kids starting in the mid-90s, and I'm still in touch with them, you know, almost 20 years later now. And, and it's really striking to me because the brightest kids in my classes have all done well, basically. I haven't seen any of them really stymied. You know, this is a society that's allowed them to do this. There was also, like, they were kind of split. Some of them were party members who had been kind of brought into the Communist Party, which was a sort of a special honor at the school. And some of them were not. And I haven't noticed any advantage among the people that were party members, for example. I mean, and if anything, I think it probably held them back a little bit. You know, the more spectacular successes were the kids who stayed away from that stuff. And so, and I think that's a common story for this last generation, that, that people had lots of opportunities, the society gave them enough space to develop. And I think this might be changing a bit now, because you're getting more of an entrenched middle class, you have a big expansion. When I taught, there were 3 million college students. Now there's 23 million. You know, there's suddenly lots of new universities. You can, you can pay or use connections to get into college a lot easier. And I think the next stage is, is, for the, is uh, where people are not going to see such a clear mobility as they did before. And, and then eventually they'll, they'll start to try to figure out some of these. I think the civil society, the, the social institutions are things that, are, that, are, that they'll see the lack for them in the next generation. 
outside observers of China often argue that this rising generation, the people who are your students 20 years ago, are much more nationalistic and in a way that uh, is much scarier if you're, if you're sitting in Delhi. Do you, do you perceive a change? Do you see a new kind of nationalism? You know, I think the nationalism, I think it's a mistake to track any one group. I think you need to track people over time. And Chinese people, when they're very young, are much more na national. It's kind of the opposite of in America. You know, people are very liberal in college, and then as they get older, they become more conservative. And, and in China, I've always felt like it's kind of the opposite. You know, like they're, they can be very nationalistic and very conservative in a way when they're young, partly because the, the state's been very effective at controlling the education system. Um, and then as they get older and they have real experiences, they change. I mean, the, the kids I taught, they're not nationalistic now. They were very nationalistic when I taught them. And so I think you do see this happen. As people get older, they're, they're, you know, they, they have more contact with society. They understand their society's weaknesses better. Um, so I don't, know, I don't really see a trend of China becoming, and I know it gets written about a lot. I, I haven't seen that as dramatic. But but Dan, can I ask uh, yes, please. Peter a question? You know, the, I mean, I tend to believe that democracy and capitalism generally go together. And state control and capitalism generally do not. Mm -hmm. And so the question is that, you know, I mean, this is a, a Chinese pers person I know raised this in my mind. And he said that, look, uh, India has, but as Nandan mentioned, India has produced about two dozen globally competitive companies now. And, they, and there are another two dozen who are waiting in the wings, probably another five, ten years. And certainly three to five of these companies will become global brand names. And he, he said, this is a Chinese person, businessman who said that China would die to have such companies there because he says state-controlled companies will never be able, run by uh, government actors, will never be as nimble as entrepreneurs can be in the global market in terms of decision making and, and, and competitiveness. Uh, and so, I mean, the point is uh, to my, that, that eventually uh, won't China need just for competitiveness to be a more uh, democratic, liberal society. I think so. And I think also to develop the top talent. I mean, I think they've been incredibly effective at educating the basic level and uh, you know they've, they've really done an impressive job with literacy and, and but I think when you get to the higher education while they have been building a lot of universities and expanding universities the education is still not you know not what it really should be and, and if they, if they want to be competitive and I think that's a, that's the, the, people recognize there's a need for that you know and, and that's a step that they need to take and I do think you need a more open society at some point to do that. Nandan and Gertrude, I mean, you, you, know, you know how these things are discussed in Delhi, and there's, there is a sense of a more assertive China in, in the region, on the border, on the global stage. Um, do, you, do you see those fears as warranted, and um, how do you see India responding to any new assertiveness on China's part? Well, I think uh, certainly uh, people are very watchful of what's happening in China, but I think uh, a lot of the people thinking about these issues realize that uh, really the best thing is for India to, to do well. I mean, that if, if, if India is able to uh, grow rapidly, if India is able to meet the aspirations of its people, if India is able to create a, a level playing field for its uh, people, I mean, that, I mean, being strong internally in the sense that internal and external are very much linked together, that our best sort of antidote in some sense is to become stronger within. And I think that's what is driving a lot of the people who are thinking about uh, these issues. And I think, you know, I think while we are seeing, uh, you know, huge, uh, uh, you know, reactions on corruption and then on the whole issue of this terrible episode in Delhi, I think it's all part of the, uh, you know, the aspiration of people meeting the system. And sooner or later, all this will have to lead to uh, changes that will bring uh, better things. I mean, you know, if, if you look at uh, uh, what happened in the U.S. in the civil rights moment, I mean, you can think of the episode in Delhi as our version of the Rosa Parks moment when the U.S., one lady in a bus not being allowed to sit in the sort of the colored section of the bus led to the whole explosion of civil rights and Martin Luther King and, and the Civil Rights Act and all that. So in some sense, you can think of these also as episodes that 
has created so much outrage, and that outrage is further amplified by television and social media, that it, it, it spurs the demand for change. Because I think in a, in a democratic society, you need spurring the system to change. So I think these are all, all the changes will now start happening. It will not happen as fast as people want it, because people want instant solutions. But it's definitely going to happen. I think finally, the only stable society is going to be a fair and open society. The, the, I, I agree with uh, Nandan that the best defense is a strong economy, a rising uh, economy, and a growing middle class. But your question was a security question, I sensed. And frankly, the rise of China threatens the world, and the rise of India does not threaten the world. I feel threatened by the rise of China, very honestly. Um, the, the irritations that they are doing on our borders, their uh, way they're behaving with the Japanese, with the Vietnamese, with Americans. And, and, and you know, I think sometimes we forget our national interests. I mean, we should, of course, have a good dialogue with in, uh, China and Pakistan. But when our two neighbors are giving, I mean, one neighbor is giving the other neighbor nuclear technology on an go ongoing basis, and um, that nuclear technology is meant to be used against us, I mean, I, I feel threatened. Peter, does that uh, strike you as warranted, or would you, would you reassure Gertrude Hunter that? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not as frightened by the rise of China, I guess. Um, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a different place. Um, I, I think that, um, I think it's not a strongly militaristic society. It really hasn't been. They, this is not a culture that traditionally has looked for military solutions. I mean, if you're really looking at, I mean, in a lot of ways, based on the last 10 years, I'm more concerned about the United States, you know, in terms of, military security issues. To be, and I'm, not being, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, it's, you know, we as a, as a society are more likely to see that as a, as a solution. And I haven't seen the Chinese doing that. Um, I, you know, I think it's an incredible benefit to have all these hundreds of million, 300 million people out of poverty. And I think that, you know, again, my perspective is a little different coming from Cairo now. And you see, you know, that's a really tough situation that they have there. And, and a, a, you know, a lot, of, a lot of countries in that part of the world are in a tough situation now. And I, I think in some ways it's fortunate that, that China has been stable during this period. There's a lot of other directions it could have gone. And again, we have to remember that this society was really incredibly traumatized. And, and I, you know, I, I think that the overall arc has been positive. And I see that also in the people that I've known in China, the people I've known for 15 years, I don't see them becoming less reasonable or, you know, more extreme. I see the opposite. And, and the, my last trip back last year, I was impressed by, I, I think there's sort of a new thoughtfulness. People are, are becoming interested in analyzing their society, I felt like, in a way that they weren't, you know, 10 years ago. Um, so I think these are positives, but it's, it's, it's a bumpy road, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a quick process. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think on the whole, I tend to be optimistic, you know. All right. Well, we'll now go to the audience and see if someone can um, persuade uh, any one of these optimists that there's cause for pessimism anywhere. Um, please identify yourself and ask a question. Don't give a speech. Um, and we let's have, start. We have a lot of, uh, we've got a student stand here. We have got a lot the, of different oh questions. Who do you want to go with? I, I will, um, there, there's a woman in a red shirt with two hands up right there. Let's go first with her. Two, two hands. hands. Yeah. Okay, two stand hands. up, wow. please. Ah, here we go. It's not a speech, just two points, one to Mr. Nirukani and one to Mr. Das. On your China and India point, you know, I was something from your book, Difficulty of Being Good, was flashing through my mind when you were talking about it, where you spoke, uh, spoke about the Ryodan and envy. Don't you think this whole China and India thing is being driven by envy from the world? on behalf of us and within India and China also. I mean, when you say you're threatened by China, is that somewhere driven by envy for their success? I mean, uh, I don't get that. And same way, I think the West is envious of the growth cycle that we are facing now, which they've come to a standstill. And that's why the India-China story is so popular. And that's just, I mean, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that Duryodhan and Envy thing which you wrote in your book was completely flashing right now. Let's let him respond to, respond to that. One question per person, I'm sorry to say, but is there a lot of hands? Um, 
Well, I mean, the world is driven by envy. So that's not new. It's how we manage it. And uh, nations in particular, when I said I feel threatened by China, I was really sending a small message to our leadership. I, the last India would be the last country that you say pick up arms and go to war. No. It's just that that mindset of India should be that we need friends, that today we think we can go it alone, that non-alignment mindset has not gone away. And in, in, the, in a world where you're facing two neighbors who are threats, we should just ensure not only that we are rising economically, but that we are prepared from a security point of view to, 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 to manage that. So it was not an aggressive statement at all. We have uh, a young student on the left here. Yeah, let's go right there. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lei Yuan. Um, I'm a Chinese university uh, student from Shantou University, China. And it's our first time in India, and we have got a lot of surprises. So just I have just move away from the, um, the, the speaker. Just yeah. move slightly away from the speaker. Move this way. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, I have um, two questions. One is for Peter. Um, could you please, uh, when, when, you, when we know you, uh, you were in China f for the first time in mid 1990s, and could you please talk about your um, biggest surprise when you first came to China and your biggest surprise when you first in India? Thanks. Okay. Good question. Um, yeah, it's a good question. It's 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 hard for me to answer in some ways. I mean, I think. I think in China, my biggest surprise was that it was not an intensely political state and that people, individuals had a lot of, that, that they didn't feel this political weight, that I, I think we, we had assumed that that's, uh, you know, that, that, that it's like that. I mean, from, from India, I mean, my impressions are pretty limited. I've only been here for a day, actually. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, this is, 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 is you know, is, is, is very impressive to me, this sort of event. And I mean, when we do talk about sort of the, the civil society. This is the kind of thing you can't do in China, mm -hmm. basically. You, know, you, you couldn't have this sort of festival. Um, you know, they, so, I mean, they, they have small festivals, but they, they, have to, they can't be totally affected. I mean, I, and I couldn't get a visa for one of them two years ago when I was invited for the literary festival in Beijing. And so, you know, I think this is something that's very striking to me you know, when I come from the outside. Okay, thanks. Um, another question for all speakers. Um, so um, the key word of India in China now is about the rapes. And um, could you please share your opinions on improving gender equality um, to, the, to the development of India? Thanks. Well, as, as I said, I think uh, <laughs> Uh, difficult ones. It's all men. No, I think, I think uh, certainly I think this episode was very horrific. And as I talked about the Rosa Parks episode in the U.S., you know, in every society there's some event which happens which triggers tremendous outrage. And that outrage leads to actual changes on the ground, whether they are of policy, security, and all that. So I'm very hopeful that th though this was a very horrible incident, it caused so much outrage among everybody and so much of uh, anger that I think it actually will be the impetus to bring a lot of change in improving conditions, in improving gender equality and all that. You know, it would just, could I yeah, just uh, uh, make one addition to the point that our politics has been focused on giving uh, things to sectional interests, meaning reservations for the low caste, uh, meaning uh, subsidized rice, for the, for the poor, meaning free power to the farmers. They're all sectional. Here's an incident where it's a question of law and order which everybody benefits from. So for the first time, a politician is realizing that, my God, everybody will benefit from something like this. And this, only when you have a demand for reform, do you get reforms? And this is where the hope, I think, lies in this mm. new middle class, which is now about a third, a quarter to a third of India. And China, of course, is half of China. 
and I think in a decade it will be half in India too. So this is an important moment. Let's go. Someone. Uh, we, have, we actually have a question just okay. over here. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, I'm a Tibetan student from Delhi University. Uh, my question is, the issue with Tibet has been a uh, factor between the uh, sino indian relationship. And some people say that the sino indian border issue cannot be solved as long as the Tibet issue is not solved. And some people say that Tibet issue is just a, a smaller part of the game. So what are you taking on the uh, issue? Thank you. This is peripheral. Peter, do you want to address that briefly? Um, Tibet. I think that while I tend to be optimistic about China as a whole, I'm not that optimistic about the Tibet issue, to be honest. And, and, and I think that it's, uh, you know, we haven't seen a lot of movement on that from the Chinese side. We don't really see leverage points from the outside. I, I think it's a very frustrating, very depressing situation, basically. And, and something similar also in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs. You know? So I, I, I think that's a, that's a tough situation. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of questions. Yeah. What do you think on the front here? Great. Hi. Please stand up. Hi. Um, my name is Namrata, and I think my question goes out to whoever wants to take it. And that's um, in regards to uh, Gurcharan Das, you said part of India's problem is that it has a weak state. So could one of the ways in which we could strengthen our state is if we give it less to do? <laughs> well, I that's think uh, uh, <laughs> that's a very, very good question. At least if it focuses on the central reason why the state exists. Why was the state born? In every society, the state really was born and given a monopoly of violence. By the way, this is what Bhishma tells you, Dishter, in the Mahabharata also, that the state was created for law and order. So if what has, what has let us down in the 65 years is that the basic function of a state of governance, the whole danda niti, which, is the, which was the medicine, this has, and this goes back to the issue of the courts, of the police, you know, uh, my son has been trying to get an FIR against a cook and it's been over a month and we have friends in IB and all. Delhi police still haven't put, registered the FIR. So imagine with all the privileges that we may have, uh, an ordinary person trying to register an FIR. Now that goes to the heart. No, no, but I think uh, uh, I, I think we should recognize that, that notwithstanding that there are risks of an o overbearing state, that there are some things that only states can do. I mean, of course, one is of course to provide law and order, but going beyond that, I think you know, creating a level playing field for business, creating an educational ecosystem that allows everybody to get education, creating a, a, a quick and efficient judicial system creating, uh, you know, roads, a lot of those things only states can do. So I think we must recognize that state, state, the state has a very important role in uh, public life. At the same time, if there are areas which are better done by private enterprise or which are better done by uh, civil society organizations, then we need to cede space for them. So I think it's not about state versus market or state versus society. It's about finding the right balance between the state, the society and the market. We have a gentleman just here. Uh, this is Vinod Singh. And my question is addressed to Mr. Gujaran Das and possibly to Nandan as well. Uh, you have made a case that uh, India has traditionally been a strong civil society, strong society, and a weak state. And what we need is actually Indian state to become a little stronger. Now, it's really uh, a dichotomy that in spite of the strong civil society throughout our, throughout our history and in the last 65 years as well, we still have one of the most dysfunctional and weakest state. Now, we do have a lot of prescription that what a state should do, what a good state should do. 
But how do we get a good state? That's the big question. How do we get a good state when the Indian parliament agrees you only on two things unanimously? When it comes to upping their perks and privileges or opposing the electoral reforms? Let's, so let's, how do we yeah. get a good state? Well, um, the things that we need to do, the reforms of the police, judiciary, bureaucracy, and the electoral system, they've all been spelled out beautifully in dozens of reports. And your question is, how do we make it happen? It's a very difficult question. If we were lucky, we could get a strong leader who was also a reformer. Now, we've had strong leaders. We had Indira Gandhi. But Indira Gandhi, well, instead of being a reformer of institutions, she was a destroyer of institutions. So that's the wrong kind of leader. But there have been leaders in democracies who have been reformers. But you can't depend on it. So the only hope I see today is really this rising middle class. In other words, the assertion in the Anna Hazare movement and all that. Now, these are not the right, you know, protests will only take you so far. But the demand that they are creating is very impressive. And because, I mean, politicians are smart people. They're not dumb. And they know where the votes come from. And they are suddenly realizing today that maybe the votes will not just come from reservations and the standard formulas that they have used of giveaways in the past. And so I personally think that uh, the rising middle class, use of technology, uh, mess messaging, Facebook, all this, are really the kinds of uh, sort of uh, levers that could make a difference. Yeah, no, I think uh, it, it's... No, I don't think it's a choice of what political system you have, whether it democracy is this or that. I think one is what's going to happen in the next 10 years. I think if per capita incomes grow, you know, now it's at about $1,500 per person, it grows to four or $5,000 per person. When you have much higher levels of literacy, when you have much higher levels of urbanization, when you have a much larger population that is speaking English, where everybody has a mobile phone with video on it, I think you're going to enter a very different world. And as uh, Gurcharan mentioned, unlike past agitations that were sectoral in nature, you know, for farmers or for this caste to be put in the backward list or whatever, the last two major agitations were in the nature of public goods. One was saying that we need less corruption in our life. And the second was saying that we need to get a more secure gender equal, equal society. So this is a very new phenomenon where the demand from the public is not for a class of people, but something that has a universal public goods flavor about it. So that's a very positive thing. And therefore, as incomes grow and as a greater proportion of people demand universal public goods, which is better law and order, better health care, better education, then I think that transformation will happen. It won't happen in a hurry. But definitely, you're going to see huge changes in the coming 10 years. We have a lady to your stage, right? Yeah, Era? Era, did you have a lady there that had a yeah. question? Um, so my question is, basically, I came across this book called The Empire, and uh, I've been always thinking about this, I've been pondering about this, that more than India and China, it's about the global world and China. So when all the identities based on ethnicity or communal identities are dissolving to give way towards a multitude, where does China stand? Peter, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's hard for, it's kind of hard to answer. I mean, if you look at what, the, the deal that China's state has basically had with the people, I feel like for the last 15 years or so has been that, you know, we're giving you space to grow and our ideology is no longer communism or any sort of strictly political idea. It's about growth, it's about work, it's about being able to improve yourself. And I think this was very effective for, for, for at least a decade in China. And, and it's, it's something that all people could buy into, basically. And, and I think this is why China worked quite well during that period. And, and 
I, I think in some ways the Chinese want to sort of export this idea, you know, what they're doing in Africa and in other places is, is very development based and, and, and very pragmatic and it's not based on whether the, the political system in that country is a good system or a democratic system. It's based on, you know, let, we'll help you build your infrastructure and get resources out. And I think that doesn't export as well as it works in China. It's easier for the Chinese to buy into that than it is for Africans to buy. And I, th I think even though China is doing a lot in Africa, there's a lot of resentment as well because it, you know, so I, it, this, is, this is an interesting issue that I think we're gonna see play out a lot more over the coming decade. One over there. Yeah, we have a question over here. Yeah, my name is Sanjay. My question is, why this obsession with China? No, only completely. this panel, yeah. Nobody uh, else. No, yeah. no, this is just, yes, it's completely <laughs> narcissistic approach. Like, we have been praising ourselves and criticizing China. We, we have, India and China have never been together in history. We no, no connection, except some tourists came from China, wrote a book, and then that's the only connection we see. So why this obsession now? Second thing is that, uh, yeah. Yeah, just, just, just one, because we only yeah. have a few minutes. Yeah, so. Uh, Gertrude, why well, are you obsessed well, with China? I, I think uh, it's, 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 it's much better to be obsessed with China than with Pakistan. <laughs> Pakistan brings us down into identity politics and China raises our aspirations for better infrastructure, better... Uh, so I'm very glad that we have an obsession with China because I think it, it, it forces us to see how much better we could, we could also be than the way we are. Okay, we have a, oh, more comments? Or if no, not, we have a question to your far right. Um, going back to the governance of India, um, I see today like my peers, I, I'm, I go to college and my peers, they're more interested in going into business and earning wealth and uh, instead of going into politics or the legal system. Now, I was just wondering, could that be because there's so much emphasis on economic growth in India? And that's why there's that gap between how amazing our constitution is, but it's not being implemented to that extent. Like, we don't see it in our <coughs> society. Nandan? Well, I think uh, certainly a lot more young people are looking at business and entrepreneurship. Uh, I don't know whether it's linked to the nature of the governance or just that over the last 20 years in a more liberalized economy these kind of things have you know making money has become much more respectable and more people are doing it but i, I can tell you because i i've you know i've been in the government for three and a half years and i see very very fine young idealistic young people coming and wanting to work with 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 my organization uh, because they also want to contribute. So while there are people, or they say, let me work with this kind of thing for two, three years and then go back and figure out how to make money. So I think, I, I do find there's quite a bit of idealism among young people to do things too. I'd, I'd like to add one point. The end, you ended your question in a very interesting way where you talked about the constitution. And I think that's, maybe there's something very important that you implied. That is to say that in 1947, you know, we had this very, very outstanding bunch of people who created for us a really outstanding constitution, very much like the United States, the same kind of caliber of people in the public, in the public space. Unfortunately, nobody after that sold these wonderful ideas to the people in the way of the language of the people. So the masses, the ordinary people thought that there had been something fallen from heaven, which was this constitution. But no, the last person who had tried to sell the liberal ideas was Mahatma Gandhi through the language of dharma. And the people understood. He fought against untouchability. He fought for communal harmony on the basis of dharma. Now. You know, I think that that's been a failure, that the political class, was, which is the right class to teach people about these things. You know, every country actually has a code word. The code word for the United States is liberty. And this code word, by the way, unlocks the secrets of that country. And all the good and bad things in America happen because of liberty, including the Tea Party movement. Right. China has a code word, egalite. 
equality. France. And they do, I'm oh, sorry, France, not China, France. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Mao's China. But France is the country obsessed with egalite, and they will do crazy things like this new tax on the super rich. <laughs> India's code word is dharma. Our, found, our founding fathers were so obsessed with the moral project that they were undertaking. They put the wheel of dharma in the middle of the flag as Ashok Chakra to remind us of this every day. So as a part of our political project going forward in India, that's really one of the imperatives is to unlock and to translate this in our constitution into the language of the people. I think we have time for one more question, so yep. it, should, it should be a blockbuster. I hope it's a good one, sir. <laughs> He's been very insistent. <laughs> No, it's very comforting to uh, hear that uh, the uh, weak state is the cause of all our problems and not us because we are, <laughs> as people, we are strong. But then I come from Chennai and uh, recently there were a spate of five holidays for all the banks. Now there is, uh, as a kind of an opposite to that, I see the Korean companies in Chennai and the managers who come there don't seem to want a holiday at all. Now, why does the, uh, these, the words uh, um, work ethic, why is it not figuring in any of your discussions on how India will progress forward or not? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, you can, the, I'm very shy of cultural explanations and the direction in which you are going. <laughs> You, you know, this is very easy for us to say, oh, in every party you go to, oh, but Indians are corrupt. Well, it's the same Indians when they cross the immigration line at Heathrow, they start paying their taxes, they don't stop, they don't throw litter on the street, they stop at the red light. So it's not, cultural explanations are not, that kind of culture changes very fast. It's a question of rules a rules-based government that you talked about. When you have rules, certainly in the, if you have rules, the kind of rules you are used to in the private sector, if you create this kind of rules, rules is a form of governance as well. And so I think it goes back again to the issue of governance and not culture. Yeah, I think this is, I mean, also if you look at if you look at what was written about China by foreigners in the late 1800s, it's very striking how lazy the Chinese are and, and uh, how nothing has ever changed there. It's the country where things just go in circles again and again. And so, yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, I think that all places have the opportunity for change depending on how the structures are there for people to interact with. So, Anything done? Well, you can um, interrogate all three of these guys further as they'll be signing books uh, just across the way right after this. But for now, please give them all a round of applause and uh, let's hope their optimism is warranted. Thank you so much. And as a sign of our appreciation from the festival, please accept a scarf. And thank you so much. Yes, as um, Daniel just said, our three authors will be going over to the book signing table. Please go and you can have photos, questions and signatures there. Please don't crowd them here. Please go over to the book signing table and we'll have a short tea break and then we'll be back.